what's your training schedule, I guess, looking like now with everything going on and some courts shut down and everything? Well, it's, uh, it's slow. I can tell you it's, it's, it's very slow. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do other things than tennis. Basically I'm not doing tennis at all. Like maybe once a week, twice a week maximum, which is nothing for us. Yeah. Compared to, I guess, usually seven days a week is what you're used to six or seven days. Yeah. A week. It's, it's all day. It's, tennis is here, you know, it's, it's keeping going, keep going. And, and it's, it's practicing. I'm doing all my life tennis, you know, so now this moment without tennis at all is so difficult for us, but uh, I get over it, you know, so I'm doing boxing, I'm doing running, I'm walking with my family, you know, I try to do to other things, you know, to, yeah. to keep myself busy and fit, of course. Exactly. Exactly. For me, myself, um, cause I was in the midst of training for tennis as well. And it kind of hit me hard when everything kind of got shut down, right? Just like that. No, no real warning for me. I had a lesson planned. Uh, for a Monday and on the Sunday night we got a email saying the club was shut down so that was a bit of a shock but I've really taken this opportunity to work on the mental side of the game of tennis reading different books um, and even what I've spent a lot of time doing is watching old tennis matches and not not looking at it as a fan but more looking at it as like a studying tool and I really try and pick out certain pieces of tennis that I'm focusing on and, and try to improve that way and how does it work it's uh it's interesting there's definitely a lot of things that i don't that um maybe not would have realized beforehand about tennis that i pick up on now especially for a lot of players you'll see it where they'll have a couple bad shots in a row and you can just tell that it's just not going right for them you can tell the frustrations there that their serve isn't there they start double faulting a lot more and yeah. that's we'll, eye-opening we'll to me on the pace of the of, of starting the serve you know yes. it's like go faster and faster and not taking their time and routine to, to make the next point. Yeah. yeah. And it's really kind of stood out to me the best of the best and what their mental approach to the game is someone like Federer or someone like Nadal or Djokovic and just seeing how, when it seems like their back is against the wall, how right. cool and comp- and composed they are in those situations. And I try and just replay those moments in my head, in my head and hoping that I can somehow replicate that on my level of tennis when I get back out there. Well, that's the difference between these guys, like you mentioned, and 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 the majority of the people who play tennis. You know that yeah. on the on the most important moments, on the most um, difficult moments, I would say in their match, they can have their composure still. You know, and can they can still play that point as they played their first point in a match. Whether you and I will go a little bit crazy, or we go in panic, or we go in the red, how we call it. You know, and then you were like not playing your perfect weight of, of the next point. And, and, and that's the biggest difference in our level is like everybody can play pretty good, de- decent tennis, but the level of, of mental, you know, or uh, stability, that's there's where you can make the change uh, and, yeah. and the difference. How early on in your career did you kind of get a grasp of how important the mental side of tennis is to, to your performance? God, that's a bad question to me because I was bad. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> I was well. I had a I had um, difficulties with myself. I had a war with myself. Um, when I was on court, I, I was uh, I was fighting the opponent. I was fighting me, and then the most of the times I was fighting my parents too. You know, like on the court, yeah. and that's something that many players have. And I couldn't cope with it. I couldn't um, deal with it for a long, long time. And uh, as they say, you know, when you get older, you get more experienced and you get wiser. Well. For certainly that was the case for me, um, and I would say I still, you know, haven't figured out everything. But now I'm 36, and uh, I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, but uh, throughout my singles career, it was a it was a tough thing to handle because, yes, I had a potential to play good. I beat a lot of good players. I beat a, lot, I had a pretty okay ranking, but um, yeah. The, Mental part uh, was uh, something that held me back from uh, from the good results and maybe breaking into the top 150 or 100. I don't know what my uh, ranking would be, you know, but um, I would never know. Yeah. Is there somebody that you've relied upon in the past couple of years to get over that hump? Um, or is it just you yourself going through that experience and learning on your own? Um, well, when I make the switch to doubles, I try to use the thing that I didn't, that didn't work for me 
the stress, the panic on court, and I try to implement it in the right way in doubles. So now I have the guy next to me, and I can give him actually, hey, don't worry, you know, I've been through this, and I can like mentor him or help him. And somehow it helps you too by someone to help someone. You know, it helps you too, and that's that's a funny thing. You know, when you try to teach tennis to someone, somehow you're thinking, hey, that's actually what I'm saying. I know these things already, you know, so now I have to use it myself. And sometimes when you're on court, you don't use that. But when you have somebody next to you, so that's in doubles, it makes it a little easier. So when you have when you have uh, joy on court, you can share it. When you have fear on court, you can share it. When you have panic, you can your partner can help you out and vice versa. And I think in doubles, it makes it, in that case, a little bit easier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a really good perspective, I think, to take playing doubles. For me, myself, in my short time playing doubles in tennis, yeah. it's something I've struggled a lot with mentally. Is It's almost to me, I feel like, to me personally at least, doubles tennis is a bit harder mentally to me than singles tennis. Because right. in singles tennis, if I make a mistake, I only really have myself to be upset with and yeah. I can kind of get over that pretty quickly. Yeah. But in doubles tennis, if I make a mistake, not only am I costing a point for myself, but I'm costing a point for my teammate. And so I find myself, I'm getting better at it, of course, but at the beginning I used to be really timid and really, I guess, non-committal to my shots um, in doubles because I didn't want to make that one mistake to let my partner down. Yeah. So now you have another problem, right? And this is a different thing now is coming, you know. So in tennis, you always find new approaches, new challenges. Now you got one thing out of the way. Now another thing comes, like you said, you know. Now you don't want to make mistakes because you're afraid of your reaction of your partner. And this is a different mental thing that is typical for doubles. You know, some players don't give a fuck, you know, and they just do their thing. And whatever, they make mistake or whatever, they don't care. And the other guys get intimidated by their partner um and 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 gets new to new problems and and also there i've i went like this you know with some partners i felt better with other partners i felt less and and this is something you have to deal with and 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 learn with it and i think i find the sweet spot the 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 guy that i'm currently playing with uh the moliner you know uh, He's a really complimentary guy, you know, uh, and, and, and he makes me feel good. Sometimes there's difficult moments. We speak about it. We talk about it. Uh, and, 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 and then you try to put it on court again. And that's what it is with doubles. It's, it's one word. It's communication. I think those difficult moments are inevitable in any partnership, not even just with tennis. In life in general, right. when you're in a relationship or a partnership with somebody, difficult moments arise. Right. But again, I think it's having that strong mental game and being able to deal with it in a healthy manner rather than with anger or with spite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, true. And, 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 but when you, um, the, the thing that I feel is the most difficult for me at this moment as we speak right now, mentally on doubles, is that I feel like sometimes I'm getting so angry inside uh, that I feel my partner tries to help me so much, you know, that he feels like that his level goes down and then I feel like I'm going up, you know, so, and, and that's really dangerous, you know? so now you have to really look for the, the sweet spot that, yes, you can release yourself from anger, but at the same time, you know, you, it cannot be an uh, influence of your partner. If you feel like your partner is having a bit too much influence or trying to have too much influence, is that something you bring up in the middle of a match or do you wait until the match is over? That's a very good question. That's a very good question because some players, they, uh, they really uh, talk at, at a court in a match. And some players are really sinus and go after the match. They say, listen, you know what? On 3-3, love 15, I didn't like what you're doing there. Or I said, listen, I liked it a lot that you, you're coaching me all the time, you know. So in my case, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a mixture. Um, I like to be coached on court, but not that much. Uh, because I want to feel like, hey, I can, I can solve this problem by myself too, you know. And I don't want you to worry about me because I got this, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, when, and that's a silent killer, when you're playing a certain level, nobody says anything. You feel like, hey, your level goes down without yourself knowing it, you know? And then you need someone to, hey, come on, you know, put it in, you know, and like get it over, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's a fine line, you know? But then again, you're one year with a partner, you're, you're always talking, you know, like it's also, you have to watch out for, to get too close to each other, you know, and get irritation there. So doubles, it's, it's, it's a whole new thing. <laughs> it is. It's, it's um, state to singles. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What was your um, 
I guess, thought process or decision-making process be, behind switching from singles to doubles? Was it more of, you know, some, you just weren't enjoying singles as much and you wanted to try out doubles was a mental, mental thing. You just maybe felt like you fit better in doubles tennis. When I was a singles, I made it to top, top 200. Um, that was, uh, good enough maybe to play the challengers and sometimes the qualities of the grand slams, but not enough to, to, uh, to make you work of it and, and earn money from it. And at 31, I realized, Hey, listen, this is, this is not going to work. And I need to, to switch. I had two choices. Either I stop tennis or I go to doubles. <laughs> and then I, I chose to, uh, to, to go to doubles because I always felt, Hey, like there's something in me that I can still achieve in tennis. And, uh, and I think I made the right choice. I started in 2015 with a ranking of 380 or 370 or something like that. And I, within a year, I was top 50. Um, so I think I made the right choice. Yeah. That's going to be one of the more difficult things for an athlete to come to terms with is whether they're transitioning from, from their sport to outside of sport or a change of direction within their sport, but admitting to themselves that what they're doing right now, they might have reached the end of the line um, and it's time to move on. Because I think a lot of athletes, they attach a lot of value to what they do, understandably, because it's their job, it's their life. Um, And it's got to be, I guess I'm, I'm kind of wondering, was that a tough decision for you to make? Was it tough for you to accept that maybe singles wasn't the best choice for you anymore and to transition to doubles? Well, when you're 31 and you're essentially playing only futures at that moment, you know, you know that you're in the end of the, of the line here, you know, and you've got you to gotta really uh, make the right choice here because I try to always extend my singles career uh, because I think, you know, I always thought, you know, I, I have the level, I have something to make it further than I came, but somehow I couldn't push it through. And then, uh, and then what's happening, you know, your piece of your pride is, is hurt. You know, you're, you're hurting a little bit and you feel like, hey, I'm not good enough and all these questions and you're going to doubt yourself. And then the emotions are popping in and all these things are really tough as a tennis player or as a sportsman at all, you know, because many guys have this problem. Many uh, girls have the same problem when they're, you know, when they give everything they have, they put so much work in it, they, they practice for 10, 20, 30 years and, and, and they don't achieve what they want. And that's a, that's a tough decision. Um, however, I never wanted to give up. So to quit tennis was never an option for me. Never. Um, so, um, and, and it wasn't, I was in Egypt. I, I lost the first round in the future, 31 years. I felt so miserable. And that was the moment I walked back to my hotel crying, feeling really bad. And I said, okay, this is it. Um, next year, January next year, I'm going to start doubles. No question to ask. It's going to be, that's the choice. I made a choice. So I needed that push, you know, by losing the first round. Um, funny enough, you know, that week after I won singles and doubles in the future. And then I won a, and, and then I went to Morocco and I won the doubles again and I won the, and I made final singles. So suddenly everything got released a little bit, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was no question that uh, I made my choice and uh, I was starting in January, 2015 with, uh, with Wesley to, uh, to, you know, and to, uh, to conquer the doubles. Basically. Yeah. And it's obviously been, been the right decision for you seeing how high your ranking has gone in doubles and all the titles you've won to date. Do you yes. approach a match from the mental perspective of it? Do you approach a doubles match differently than a singles match or is it just tennis in your mind? Um, well, you know, in the beginning when I started in 2015, I was, I was, uh, I was not a great doubles player. Um, technically position wise, uh, tactical wise, and also, still in a mental wise, you know, I didn't still didn't know how to really, um, cope with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the beginning when I was playing singles, I had one plan and I knew the the tennis guys, I knew the players I was playing and I knew my plan. Now I'm playing doubles. Suddenly there are different players there. You know, I have no idea who these guys are. Um, me, I have no idea what my position should be. You know, I was really trying to figure out as we, as we were going, so the mental part of it was really not easy in the begin, uh, beginning. But at the other hand, I was playing so free. You know, like I had no expectations. So, and that moment was really nice. And then I knew when the, you know, when the moment came that everything started to get more serious. You started to get higher. The, and then the, you know, the, the, the tension coming, you know, when you're playing for top 100 or you're playing for your first ATP title. You know? So the same tension you had in your singles comes, comes back in the doubles. Uh, with that big difference is that you have someone next to you uh, to to analyze your your doubles, analyze your matches, analyze your opponents. Um, 
and it, it was a new world for me. So I, I was 31, yes, but I felt new. I felt young again. So yeah. it helped me a lot. Tell me a bit about how you kind of worked through your goal setting process or if, if you had set any goals for yourself when you started playing doubles tennis. Uh, I had uh, zero uh, goals, no expectation. I just, I was reborn as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a human being on the couture, you know, I was like, okay, I, I'm starting doubles. I am a nobody. And let me try out what's, what's going on. And I think that's that thing that, 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 that mental, um, what, what, what I set myself, you know, like no goals, uh, no expectations. Uh, we're just going to play as, play as free as possible and we see how far we can come. And that really helped us uh, because there was no tension to play super tight rate. Who cares? You know, we lose, win, lose, it doesn't matter, you know. Uh, and that was really nice to play. But when the tension getting higher, you know, then everything's got to start to shift and change, you know. And so you have to adjust accordingly. And, and that's not always easy. Yeah. It just, it just goes to show how much, you know, pressure in tennis and having have being a big name can play a role in your psyche because like you said when you start off in doubles and nobody really knew who you were you didn't really have any preconceived notion of other people i guess didn't have preconceived notion of how good you were and how you should play you had a clean slate to work with and that's got to make you feel a lot more free and allow you to play the game that you want to play rather than maybe there might be an instance where not necessarily for you, but for tennis players in general, where they try and get away from their game a bit to match the expectations that other people have of them. Yeah. So it's a good point what you're saying, especially first, like people didn't know us. They, they didn't know me and Wes, you know, and, and we had something special. Um, and, and, and they had no video analysis of us. They didn't know us. You know, we came from challenges. They had no idea to, how to play with us. And the, the, the way we played, because I have an, an orthodox way of playing doubles, I stay back, you know, I, you know, I, I, I try to really um, feed as many balls as possible with aggressiveness. And, and Wesley was really good at the net. So the, this combination was, you know, people didn't see that at that time so much. You know, there's Mark Lopez who played from the back and a few other guys, but not that much. So we were the new kids on the block. But then you see that shifting. So now we're winning and now people start to realize, hey, who we are now, they start to analyze us. And now we are the first seeded in challenges suddenly, you know? So now we are a target. And that's, and that's, and that's so difficult when you're different. I mean, when you, you know, you, you only can win or suddenly you only can lose, you know? And that's yeah. a very, that, and that shifts, you know, that's, that's really tough. No? So then you go from challenges, you go to the ATPs. Nobody knew us at the ATPs, you know. They, didn't, they knew me a little bit from the singles here and there. But, okay, now we're playing the first seed. At, the first seed didn't know who we were. Mm -hmm. uh, so we play as free as possible. And, and, and we came through pretty easy through the ATPs, you know. And, and, and then suddenly you're seated yourself. <laughs> now these guys, the other guys coming, you know, and they, they're playing like there's no tomorrow anymore. Yeah. So through all these levels, you have the same kind of experience. You know, and you've got to deal with that. And, uh, and we deal, we dealt with it pretty good, I would say. Um, um, yeah. Is is there one specific match or or one specific tournament where you look back on and you you really feel like the mental side of how strong your mental game of tennis and how it's developed has had really helped you in that specific moment? <clears throat> yeah, um, that was um, in 2015 when I decided to um, uh, to go for doubles. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, um, I started that year, like I said, the 350 or whatever. Uh, in September that year, I broke top 100 or a little bit before I broke top 100 and I played uh, Roger Federer. So me, well, in December, November, playing Futures in Egypt, now I'm playing against Roger Federer, right? And, uh, well, I better behave, right? <laughs> I better, you know, <laughs> I better be relaxed, you know? Um, and, and, and the day before the match, I was like, you know what? Whatever happens, you know, I can I can use all my experience, all my knowledge that in, that I had accumulated in tennis throughout the singles, throughout my brief uh, doubles history, and I can put it and I can show it tomorrow. So the day comes, the next day I'm playing against Federer, full stadium, you know, in his in Geneva, Fed, uh, Davis Cup, playing for my country, you know, what is it? so crazy, and I was locked in, locked in with my tennis, locked in mentally. I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I, when you toss, when we, we were drawing, you know, in the beginning, who was uh, serving and who was changing, you know, and I saw Federer a mirror of me, and I said, wow, this is the real deal. I turned around, 
And I knew already something in my mind, like, hey, everything was locked in. You know, all, all the pieces came together. I don't know why. Maybe I was lucky that day, but um, and 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 I think that's the reason why we won that match against Federer, because um, mentally I was locked in. I was like zoning. I didn't see anybody. You know, no, 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 no public, no, no audience. Even the the, the Dave's Cup coach who was sitting there and cheering for us. I didn't see him. You know, like I was locked in with Timo, and, and, and that felt great. That was and a double. These moments, these moments help maybe happen once or twice a year, you know, and, 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 and any sports player can tell you this, you know, it's, it doesn't happen a lot. When, when it happens, it's, it's a really nice feeling. That was a doubles match, right? It wasn't, that was a doubles match. I hope you didn't play singles against Roger. Cause that would have been, no, that was a doubles match. That was a doubles yeah, match. Yeah. In, in that he was playing with Chudinelli. He was playing with Chudinelli. Okay. In that doubles match, I guess I'm wondering, did you, did you try and change your game because it was Roger Federer on the other side of the net? Like, did you try to avoid hitting the ball to him because of his pedigree and, and what you know he can do with it? Or did you literally, that's, like that's you said... That's a good story. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, that's a good question because uh, we were talking about it uh, with the team before the, the, the tie. And they said, listen, if you, ha- if you, you have to hit uh, Roger Federer, would you hit him? You know, like, like you know, or you have too much respect for him. And some guys said, well, I will, don't, I will just play around him, you know. And I was like, oh, if I get a chance I'll, and I have to, I will hit him. So we play our match and I got a, like a ball, a half court, but I had to smash it, you know. I could either go to Cirinelli or Federer and I somehow chose to Roger. And I hit Roger full on his leg. But yeah. like oh, the whole the whole crowd was like to me, you know. <laughs> and I felt I had no choice, you know. Yeah. But so I have respect for this for for him as a player and as an icon and what he did for tennis. But at that moment, he's just an opponent. Yeah. So you cannot have you know like wow, well, I will not hit you because you're Roger. No, no. At that moment, he's my opponent, and you know he he prevents me from winning against him. So no. I have to do what I have yeah. to do. Is, is 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 playing against Roger where you feel like that was kind of the, the pinnacle of your career? Like that's that was like the the most successful moment in your career, I guess? Or are there other moments that really stick out to you that whether it's a certain title or your first title yeah. even that that you, you feel like that's your favorite memory of playing tennis so far? Right. Um uh, it's 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 my top three for sure, because mm-hmm. that gave I never was confident about my doubles. Um uh, 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 like what I had in doubles, I didn't know if I was good enough. So I had, I didn't have that confidence, and that gave me that confidence that, you know what, I broke top hundred, and I bet uh, I beat Federer, you know, like which is nice. Okay, in doubles, but still I beat him, you know. So that gave me such a boost, a morale boost, and I was, I felt really, really uh, um, like I was suddenly I was on the map again of tennis, and that that really uh, was a good feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, the first title, first ATP title in uh, Sofia in Bulgaria in uh, 2016 was, um, I think, also a very, a very important moment in our careers because that uh, showed us, uh, like, hey, we're not there just to compete in the ATP tour. Now we're here now to win titles, mm-hmm. and that's and that's a, and that's a huge difference. You know, there's some guys who always stay competing and and we'll stay around 90 and 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 we'll play semi-finals sometimes no we're there to uh, make finals and win tournaments and Sofia was the first one it was really special and uh, now uh, in the meanwhile I have nine titles already you know which is something if you look back to you know in, in a few years I have like nine titles and that's that's pretty amazing and uh, I still really don't realize like like in a, just such a brief career um, to, to, to be able to, to, uh, to, to get these titles. Playing in the Davis Cup and representing the Netherlands, was there any added pressure? Did you feel any added pressure for those matches, not only representing yourself, but representing your country? Funny enough, you know, when I'm playing Davis Cup, I don't feel it at all. I don't feel like, I, I, I feel like I only can win. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the doubles, you know, I had against Switzerland. I, I, we played against Czech Repo- in Czech, uh, against Czech Republic in Canada, and all these ties uh, I won with different partners. Uh, yes, I lost uh, also in Russia, but I felt like, hey, you know what? I always feel like good in Davis Cup. Uh, the same reason Timo de Bakker or Robin Haase, they always play good in Davis Cup. They 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 feel like they they can play free. They, uh, and that uh, we as a team got their backs and that's how I feel on court too you know like whatever I do mistake what I always feel like my team got our back you know 
um, and that's a really nice feeling to to play with and uh, it's a very special feeling to play for Dave's Cup you know I, I mean you go on court you get the music you get the flags you get the anthem you know it is, it's the goosebumps goes all over it and uh, and then you're actually gonna play it's it's something you know I can uh, yeah I always think back to yeah, that's one of the reasons why I really love watching the Davis Cup. And, and they had a tournament, I think it was earlier this year, was it the ATP Cup where they had the yeah. different countries as well? Yeah. But seeing players in that team environment representing their country, I always oh. find it really fascinating with tennis because tennis is such a solo sport. You see 95% of the matches these players play, they're by themselves. And it's really cool to see how much having a team around you kind of adds to the excitement and the energy level of tennis. It's always yeah. so fascinating for me to watch. So nice. Yeah, you, you see the, 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 the emotions that we as players have. When you are singles, you, know, you don't show that emotion because you don't want to show any emotion to your, to your opponent. Mm -hmm. Now you're playing Dave's Cup and everybody is like giving high fives and uh, yelling and screaming. To, uh, and, 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 and that's why I love Dave's Cup and in this case to ATP Cup. I love to watch it, you know, the... The whole team is so close to the court, you know, you can communicate and, and, and it feels like, like a team. Mm -hmm. uh, and that makes tennis really nice. And I think it's a really good add-on to, to, to the whole sport. Um, because alone is alone, you know, when you're playing singles and you have a coach and that's it, you know. Uh, but as a Dave's Cup, it's, it's, you play for your country. It's, it's a different energy. Yeah. Yeah. One of the most unique things of tennis, I, I feel is how it's an international sport and you as a tennis player you you played tournaments all over the world and all different continents in the world tell me a bit about i guess how hard it is for you to be on the road and in different countries away from your home country for so long throughout the year and maybe if this was something that bothered you more so when you were younger versus now where you might be better equipped to to cope with these changes well, to be to start off, you know, if 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 you wanna, if you have a dream to 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 be a pro tennis player, you gotta be a little bit crazy. I mean, you're gonna be on 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 tour forty weeks a year, uh, and 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 that's not easy. When you're sixteen, it's not easy. When you're thirty six, it's not easy. Um, you know, you have uh, travel stress, you have different cultures, different tournament, different uh, food, different hotel. Uh, you have to fly, you, uh, you don't see your family. Uh, um, it's, it's really tiring. Uh, but, you know, it comes with a price because the life that we have, if you succeed, is really nice. So if I would do it, I have the choice to do it all over again, I would do it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a not easy thing. And I feel like, um, now you're in the playing the bigger tournaments it's easier to travel now because now you're sitting in the five star hotels now you're flying business class and now you have good food but the whole grind that I did from 16 till I was 30 uh, oh my god you know I'm flying to, 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 to Africa I'm flying to Australia flying there all over the place you know had no money um, but then again when I think about it I really enjoyed that time because that made me the person who I am now uh, I, I learned so much. My experience level way up. Uh, my bag is full of experience and and and, and stories that I can share uh, with people that I want to, uh, or people that try to be as a, a tennis pro later. You know that I can say, hey, listen, I went to, through all this. You know, I can I can show you around and I can help you out. Uh, you know, and 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 learn them a, a thing or two. Yeah, like but you said, it's not easy to to, to travel yeah. because I'm a tennis animal. I love tennis. And all the travel around, you know, it's, it's, it's necessary, but it's, it's always wearing you down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a tennis athlete, like you said, but also you're a human and humans by nature will get upset by these things. Right. And, and like right. you said, if I feel like for any sport, there's a certain level of sacrifice that it takes to get to where you are, whether it's money, whether it's travels, time away from family, whatever it is, there has to be a certain level of sacrifice to get to the professional level or else everybody can make it with, with, with no sacrifices, anybody could do it. But I think it's really, it really goes to show how much people have the love for the game they play. When you hear about all the sacrifices they go through and all the tough times, I'm sure there was times where the money you're making in tournaments were peanuts compared to what you're making now, but it was that love for the game of tennis that kept pushing you to go further and further. And, 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 and that's the difference between me and many, many other guys who were the same level as me or better that, that stopped playing tennis and uh, went to a different life. Uh, me. Uh, being 
absolutely crazy about tennis. Me always want to do to improve my level, whatever it is, in singles or doubles or mental or whatever it is, or physical wise. So that urge to always compete and always getting better kept me alive in tennis. Otherwise, I would have stopped at 29 or 28 and say, hey, listen, guys, uh, I cannot take this life anymore because I'm earning shit. I'm going to the tank sta- uh, to, to, to the petrol station. I cannot put petrol in my, ga- in my, in my car. I cannot go, uh, you know, in a grocery store. And I had a zero on my account, you know. Mm-hmm. But, but that never, that never um, kept me away from tennis. I always say, listen, I, at least I have my body. You know? I, I, I can do whatever. You know? I'm healthy and I can go as long as possible. And, 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 and that kept me going. So, yeah, people always say, you know, you have to uh, always fight. And, and this, yeah. But it's true. You have to keep going and never give up. I, I, the, the reason I'm here today talking with you because I didn't give up. Yeah. And, 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 and that's the thing. And, and, and that's why I other stopped and I continued. Yeah. Is when, when your playing career is all, all said and done, is coaching something you have in mind? Uh, well, not in particularly yeah. as that I want to do it, but yeah. I keep it as an option. Option. Uh, I think I have a lot of, uh, to give uh, and to share. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I also like to do other things in life because you have to understand tennis is really, um, it's a one thing, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's a pretty simple thing. You know, you tennis, you go travel, you go to the hotel, you go do your practice. It, 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 it's, 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 it's pretty boring. You know, you got to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Me being really like, Oh, I want to learn everything. And I, my horizon is really wide, you know? So it's, it's not easy to always do only tennis. So after my tennis career, I was like, Hey, you know what? I want to be an entrepreneur or a coach or, I want to do this or that, you know, I want to always find out things to do after my career. So, uh, do I want to really want to be a coach? Uh, yeah, I keep that one as my options. It's, it's kind of like the saying where too much of anything is a bad thing and too much of tennis could potentially be harmful for people. And I think a lot of people, no matter what sport they play, that if they get too sucked into it, they don't allow themselves to mentally recharge. Physical rest is kind of built into sports, whether it's off days or light practices, whatever it may be. But mental resets or mental practice or mental time off might not be as built into it. So I think it's important for athletes to have these other interests outside of the sport they play because it allows them to remove themselves for a sport, whether it's for a day or a couple hours or a week, and let themselves recharge and so that they can stay you know, as close to 100% as possible um, in their mental performance. Absolutely, because um, uh, like, uh, this is the best example I can give you, what you're about to say. Um, it's like, when when it's november and the end of the season has come you go on vacation you do relax you 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 chill you don't touch your record for three weeks and you just you know your tennis is out of the door so now you're playing your first tournament again or your first match or your first practice and you're so fresh because you know you release yourself from that pressure from tennis so and and that's always a good feeling so lesson we have to take from here is like hey sometimes it's good to take yourself out of the tournament and out of the tennis in order to get feel uh, fresh again, you know, and, 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 and improve better. So, you know, so take a week out, you know, take a loss there by not getting prize money or not giving yourself to, to, to points, but release yourself from that week and to get better the next week after, you know, and, and that's not an easy thing. Even for me, sometimes like, Oh man, let me try one week more, you know, and another, let's try one week more. And that's that's sometimes an expensive lesson that that you know that yeah. many people have, including myself. With this whole coronavirus self isolation quarantine thing going on, that's something that's really opened my eyes as well. Is I've made it a point to myself to not obsess over picking up a racket and practicing as much as I used to practice. Mm-hmm. And I've again, like I mentioned in the beginning, really shifted my focus to reading books about sports psychology, books about tennis, watching old tennis matches, and it's kind of reignited that passion or the fire I had when I first picked up a racket. Um, and I can just tell that when the courts are open again, able to go play, I'll, I'll, I feel like I'm going to have that same passion fire that I had a couple of years ago when I first started playing tennis. And um, I'm not too worried now about any physical decline in my play. I think maybe 10 years ago, if this had happened, I'd be really caught up in, am I going to lose all my talent in tennis? Like I'm just going to start back from square one, but it's it's really this whole process has has been really eye opening to me that it's okay to take a month off you know 
my obviously isn't isn't optimal, but it's okay because your your talent is still going to be there to some degree with muscle memory or or you're just your your natural athletic abilities. Yeah, exactly. There's, well, there's two things to say. You know, like one thing is uh, we're not afraid that we're not going to be able to play tennis after we haven't played or touched the record for two or three months. You know, it's the physical part that's the most important. You know, you don't want to, you know, the decline in in, in, in in like in your in your muscles or your physical part. You know, you want to keep that kind of level. But the tennis wise, you know, the feeling wise, you know, that's a matter of days, and we're back to pretty much the old level that we have. You know. Um, so yeah but then you have to do your homework during these days and it's not easy uh, but you have to keep fit you have to run you have to do your physical part you know you have to get disciplined and that's tough because you have no idea when you're gonna start to play again right so you know you always have to kind of tense you know what you have to do then you don't want to do too much but you don't want to do too less you know and and, and that's uh, that's you know but the first thing you said about um about tennis and 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 and, and playing actually f- like I experienced this, that uh, I always played for work, right? And for passion. But where was the fun? I forgot, where's the fun actually? So now I haven't played for a long time. And suddenly uh, I'm playing with my neighbors who have not a good level, but I was able to play with them. So I said, Let, let's play. And, and I start to play with them. And I start to realize like, hey, I'm playing for tennis for fun. And that was so different way of playing tennis. I mean, and, and then I remember like, hey, this is the reason I started to play tennis that I like to hit the ball at there and, and, it, and it felt good, right? And, 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 and I haven't felt that feeling for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I said, yeah, this, this whole thing kind of gives you a bit of, take a bit of a step back from everything and, and realize for me, I guess that cliche of you don't know what you have until it's gone. And I didn't realize how much I love tennis and how much it was part of my day-to-day life until it got taken away. And the other thing I was going to say was this whole process is a bit easier for at least me to kind of comprehend because everyone's in the same boat. It's not the case of like an injury um, where you're on the sidelines for a couple of months yeah. and everyone else is getting better and better. Everybody's cool. in the same boat. So that kind of ha- that kind of mentality of knowing that we're all in this together, yeah. it kind of eases the pressure, at least in, in my case of, of not being able to play tennis as much as I am used to playing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I 100% agree with you because if I was the only guy now sitting here and not playing tennis and everybody started earning points and getting better, you know, and like, whoa, that's, that's not cool. And, that, and that's, 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 that's not a, a place you want to be in. Um, so now everybody is not playing. I feel I should be pretty comfortable. Okay, this year is not going to be any tournaments. I, yeah. I believe so. Mm-hmm. So I might as well, you know what, take this, um, take this opportunity to... to, to uh, to discover new things in life, mm-hmm. uh, see my family, see see people, see do other sports, uh, and, and and actually I, I love it. I love, uh, I, you know, that I bought a, a drum set a year ago, and now I start really to learning playing drums. You know, so um, and, and there's probably aspects of you playing the drums, the mental side of things, or maybe the hand eye coordination that will translate over to tennis as well. Well, actually, um, yeah, maybe perhaps because I pick it up pretty fast. Uh, yeah. I'm I'm amazed. Uh, Maybe it's, it's a little talent. I don't know because I have zero talent for uh, the piano or guitar, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, but somehow with the drums, I feel like, hey, there's something here that I uh, that sounds good, right? That yeah, sounds yeah. okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Working on that second career after tennis, maybe you'll be a drummer in a right. rock band. Well, I, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, before we wrap up here, I wanted to get your sense of, because I think it's such a common problem in tennis yeah. for tennis players, is in the middle of a match, you see it so often where the, their shot falls apart. It's just not there. They hit a couple bad shots in a row and you can just tell mentally they're defeated. And it's hard for tennis players, I think, to pick themselves back up and, and get to playing the game they want to play after making a couple mistakes in a row. So for you personally, what are some of the mental strategies or, or mental tools or things you tell yourself in the middle of a match if a couple of things aren't going your way to avoid getting in that downward spiral and, and really, I guess, just flunking out of the match? Well, uh, you got to the core question of tennis, basically. You know, this is this is what is on our level. What's tennis about? Uh, that's the difference between uh, being a top thirty or top ten or top hundred or never make it. And this is the core question. And this this question uh, I asked myself many, many, many years. Um, as I as 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 I can answer your question, I would say uh, what helped me a lot is that um, I start to believe 
in hey i can let's say my volleys my volleys is not my strongest suit right it's 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 really something i always have to work on it's, it's something that is not from nature and before i always put a lot of pressure on my volleys you know so when i start to make one volley mistake the second came pretty fast after and after that i couldn't put one volley in anymore you know? and, and 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 then i fell down in my head and i couldn't play one more point because now suddenly also affected my game in the back which is my strong suit and i found a way to block that say listen one two mistakes uh, and it doesn't affect me in the back the way i did it is that before the match i ex i say to myself I accept that I make mistakes on the, in, in the net. You know what? I'm not gonna, gonna be the best player on the net, and I accept that I can. I allow myself to make mistakes. So what happens now is that your acceptance level is way easier, you know, and it doesn't hurt you as much anymore because you said to yourself, "I accept that that happened." My partner knows that I will make mistakes, so the acceptance level is way higher. So now it doesn't affect me from the back. And guess what? Now in the back, I'm feeling much stronger because it, I know it doesn't affect me. And somehow, I'm getting stronger on the net too. Because I know I don't care if I make mistakes anymore. I don't care what everybody thinks and I will just do it. And now your, your ego is getting bigger on, on, on the net. Your ego is not hurt anymore. And the difference is amazing. So, long story short, the acceptance level that I said to myself, should be way bigger than like hey i cannot make a mistake because i have to i have to play this one and i cannot make a mistake like this you know and that, and that, and that's the wrong thing to do so i stepped away from that yes i still make mistakes on the net i still uh, get angry on the net and i still get sometimes the, the, the downward spiral but compared with what it was before it's much better yeah that really gets to another concept that i i always talk about with some of the younger athletes that i coach is you know, they have these idols. I, I work with a lot of hockey players. So they'll, they'll have these, you know, icon hockey players that they model their game after and they try and be perfect to replicate them. But when you look at the stats of the most elite athletes, they're not perfect. Like no goalie saves every shot in hockey. Right. Um, and I think I saw a stat the other day or the other month was like, I think it was like for Federer and Nadal or Djokovic, like those really, really top three, top four singles players. If you look at a tournament or a season, they only really win about 55 or 56 percent of their points, and that seems like such a, such a low number. But with the amount of points in tennis, it adds up and adds up. So, Great, yeah. if someone like Federer or Nadal only is you know essentially just a little bit you know more than a coin flip away if they're going to win a point or not, <laughs> it's not realistic for anyone else to expect to win 90 or 100 percent of their points or to hit 90 or 100 percent of their shots. It's just again, we all strive for perfection. We want to be the best we can be, but it's also about being realistic and, and practical and understanding that, that we're human and, and nobody's perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, yeah. And so, and, 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 and that's the acceptance level. Like I told you before, it's, it's really important that you, you, you accept to yourself, listen, uh, I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to, and I'm going to make 10 or 20 mistakes today on the, on the most important moments. But you know what? Uh, the feeling already that you you're okay with that that makes the whole difference already you're already one zero up because you can do that instead of being stressed about it and not and can you imagine if they have 57 percent what normal people have you know it's like yeah. every time is a coin flip it's like a lower than a coin flip basically and uh, and that's why tennis is such a difficult mental sport i would say it's 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 really tough sport yeah Definitely out of all the sports I've played in my life, I would definitely put tennis at number one in terms of how important the mental side of the game is to, to performance. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's so confronting. It's so confronting. It, it's, 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 it's it, like in, in a match, you know, you like you're doing well. So your opponent goes a little bit nuts and then the opponent goes back and you try to not to get nuts, mm -hmm. you know, like it's always this shifting goes on through the whole match and you feel it. Yeah. The opponent feels it, you know, like, and, 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 and you know, it, and it's always like, and you know you you start to recognize some moments, especially in doubles. You know you're you're set and five two up. Somehow these guys break back. You know you're five five, and you, and now you go to the super tie break. Yeah. You felt you won the tournament, you won the match already. Now you have to fight for your life. Yeah. And 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 I was on the other side, and now I'm that side, and it's a terrible feeling, you know. But now how you how you deal with these moments, how you deal with that pain inside you, that's gonna make the difference later on in your, your stage, like 
ranking wise or money wise or tournament wise or title wise, you know, mm-hmm. because now you're surviving that first round and you can win the tournament. Listen, man, I, that's, that's a beautiful point. I think that's a really beautiful point to, to end off on here. I, I appreciate you taking some time today. I wish yeah. that your, um, your, your friends and your family and yourself stay safe and healthy during this tough time. And, and hopefully we can see you back on the court soon and, and we can see tennis back on the TV. I hope so too. Thank you so much for having me. Yes.